a good near Shabbos to our friends and members of the West Mount Shul. This Shabbos is Parshas Akev, and Parshas Akev is the first full week of consolation after the tragic period of the nine days on Tisha B'Av. This Shabbos will read the second of the special Haftaras of Consolation. And remember, the Haftaras, as we said last week, just were there to replace the Torah readings that we normally had. So just like last week in Vashanan, we explained what the comfort was. So what's the comfort in Parshas Akev? And the comfort comes very early on in the Parsha. The Torah says, V'yadata im levavecha, you should know with your heart. Ki kasher yiyaser ish espeno, just as a person disciplines his child. Hashem elokecha miyasreka. Hashem disciplines you. So Rav Palm says a beautiful, beautiful concept, and he elaborates, and I want to share it with you because it's so meaningful for each and every one of us. We know that if Hashem disciplines us like a loving father, a proper father, so what happens? What happens when a parent has to discipline a child in a way that, that, the, that causes the child a certain amount of pain and anguish? What does the parent want to do as soon as possible? As soon as possible, the father or the mother has a strong desire to renew their close, loving relationship. And shortly afterwards, they will shower the child with affection and understanding and try to console the child for the pain that he was forced to inflict on the child. And that's the way Hashem disciplines. He only disciplines, just like a parent, a good parent, only disciplines when it's necessary and it hurts the parent to discipline. And even though the child deserved the discipline, but the parent wants to restore the relationship insofar as the child may mistakenly think the parent hates them. And therefore the parent will go out of his way to hug him and, and to validate him and to console him. So too is Hashem with the Jewish people. After a period of anger and punishment brought by the sins of Klal Yisrael, there always follows a tremendous stirring of heavenly love towards them, which leads to a conciliation, a, cons a, a consolation, and eventually Geula. So he takes us through a, a careful study of Jewish history and see how this, uh, this pattern of Khurban and rebuilding happens. In Malachim Beis, we find that the king of Assyria, Sancheirev, who conquered the 10 tribes of Israel, sent them into exile. He destroyed most of Yehuda and besieged its king, Chizkiyo, and the people of Jerusalem. And it looked like it was all over. They were celebrating victory the night before they were going to destroy Yerushalayim. And then on the Seder night of Pesach, Sancherev and his 185,000 soldiers were miraculously killed and Jerusalem was spared. The Talmud Sanhedrin says that Hashem wanted to make Chizkiyot the Mashiach, but it didn't happen. Why? Because Chizkiyot failed to properly sing the praises of Hashem after his miraculous deliverance from Sancherev. So he lost that supreme privilege to be the Mashiach. But nevertheless, as a display of Hashem's mercy, there was a tremendous growth in Torah learning amongst Klal Yisro in the aftermath of that salvation. And Torah flourished from the lengths and breadths of Eretz Yisrael, where they said from the north of Dan and the son of Beer, south of Beersheba, even little children became experts in the most difficult areas of Jewish law. That's example one. Example two, after the destruction of the second base of Midrash, there arose a Jewish leader, Bar Kochva, who led an uprising against the tyrannical rule of Rome. And as recorded in the Talmud Yerushalmi, Rabbi Akiva was convinced that Bar Kochva was the Mashiach. He found an allusion to it in, in Parshas Bolok. But however, the dream was shattered due to a sin Bar Kochva 
felt it was Kochi the Otsim Yadi. He felt that he had the strength to save the Jewish people. However, Bar Kochva was killed in battle. And it may seem that Rabbi Akiva was mistaken. But the truth is, he correctly perceived that after the cataclysmic events of the destruction of second base of English, there was a strong desire of Hashem to console his people and bring a Geula. But once again, the opportunity failed to materialize because of Bar Kochva's sin and the hopes of the redemption died with him. Then Tisha B'Av of 1492, nearly half a million Jews were exiled from Spain, which brought an end to the golden era of Spanish Jewry. And any Jews who remained would suffer great tortures as the Inquisition continued. But what happened after that terrible, terrible exodus? It saw the rise of the city of Tzvats and the great masters of the Kabbalah led by, by the Arizal, including Rav Yosef Karo, Rav Chaim Vital, Rav Moshe Cordovero, Rav Moshe Alshech, and Rav Shlomo Alkovitz, amongst other great people. You could see them all, their graves in Smas. And there is a sense that after such a great tragedy of such a great magnitude, there was such an opportunity for redemption. And he was awaiting the Mashiach and the Holy Kabbalists. Their writings are replete with the desires for Geula, and that's what we sing in Lacha Dodi, which contains the words, Hisnari may offer kumi, shake off the dust, arise, put on your splendid clothing. My people through Ben Yishai, Beis Alachmi, Korval Nafshi Geola, draw near to my soul and redeem it. Hisairi, wake up, wake up, Kiva as your light has come. Al Yad Ish Ben Parsi, through the man who's a descendant of Peretz, the Mashiach, then we shall be joyful. That's what we sing Friday night. And at the same time, the great masters of Allah attempted to reintroduce the Marbe Rav, wanted to introduce the process of smicha, something that we are prerequisite for the establishment of a great Sanhedrin, which be the harbinger of the Mashiach. It was a great opportunity but it sparked a tremendous controversy because there was great opposition to it from the tzaddikim who lived in Yerushalayim. They felt, what are you doing starting to think about Mashiach, not even in Yerushalayim? It was a tremendous opportunity, but because of the great machlokas that the Rabbanim had with each other, they didn't get along. So that great opportunity is lost. You see, every time there's a great tragedy for the Jewish people, Hashem's aroused. It's a, such an auspicious time. And then finally, World War I, the people at that time called it the big one, the big war. It destroyed century-long structures of Jewish communal life, caused extreme poverty. And as the war is coming to a close in 1917, the English people promulgated the Balfour Declaration, which promised the Jewish national homeland in Palestine. And when the joyful news reached Radin and the Chavetz Chaim heard this, he felt it was an itaruta de la Ela, it was an arousal from above, where Hashem is laying the groundwork for the Mashiach, but he said he's afraid that the irreligious elements amongst the Jews might destroy this unique opportunity and unfortunately, his fears were not unfounded. And then we had, unfortunately, the Holocaust, which was probably the greatest expression of Hashem's wrath towards the Jewish people. Such brutality, so much suffering. But once again, after the destruction, an opportunity for redemption presented itself. And three years after the Holocaust, the craziest thing in the world happened, that the world said we could have a state. And there's, there's great hope with this great state. And we see things are blossoming. We have to be careful it doesn't go in the wrong hands. We've seen tremendous growth of Torah in Eretz Yisrael. A tremendous growth of yeshivas in Eretz Yisrael. After such destruction, obviously, we have to believe that Hashem would open up the heavenly gates. And there's a great possibility for Mashiach to come from that. 
and we have to see how this plays out. And obviously, Hashem has given different jobs to different people. When it's in Eretz Yisrael, we see how Medina Yisrael is growing and growing, and now the majority of Jews live in Eretz Yisrael. There's such a rebirth of Torah. And it seems that Hashem has given different jobs for different people. God gave the secular Jews one job, the religious Jews another job. And perhaps Hashem wants us to live together. Perhaps all the mistakes that we made in the past where Chizkiyo did not thank Hashem sufficiently. Maybe we have to remember to thank Hashem sufficiently. Where Rabbi, where Bar Kochva felt it was kochi ba'ot yodi and didn't respect the rabbis, where the rabbis did not get along after the Spanish Inquisition, we have to realize we have to avoid these problems, and hopefully, greater days will once come, and that's the nechama of this week's parsha, that after the great destruction, we 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 sat down and commemorated the suffering of Tisha B'av that always has so many problems. But Hashem, who loves us, he's going to come back and give us a really big hug. And to know that what applies on the national level also applies on a personal life of every Jew. Often Jews, sometime or another in their lives, will experience the wrath of Hashem upon himself or upon his family. And you have to fight those natural feelings of depression. And as difficult as the situation might be, you have to know it's always followed by heavenly consolation and consolation. It's a tremendous time for growth. Hashem gives exponential success for Jews who try to grow and, and advance Hashem's agenda after these terrible times. So as we're dealing in the aftermath, as the COVID is, we hope coming to a close, you never know. And we've suffered so much in the last few months. We can hope that if Hashem has brought so much discipline to us, that we have to realize that means there has to be such a special time of rebuilding and regrowth and siyata dishmaya. But we have to be worthy of it. We have to thank Hashem that we have survived everything that's gone in the last year and a half. We have an opportunity to come back to shul. We have an opportunity to have Yom Inorayim holidays. So we should thank Hashem and not be involved in any machloikas and realize that what Hashem wants us is to yearn for that Mashiach. And to yearn for that Mashiach, Hashem says, you've got a shul. You've got a place to learn. Please show me how much sacrifice you're prepared to make. Each and every one of us has to rise to the challenge because Hashem is saying, if you will try, there'll be incredible success in these situations. The Navi Yeshaya says, watchmen, what of the night? Watchmen, what of the night? The watchman said, morning will come, but also night. If you really desire it, do tshuva and come. And Rashi explains that this prophecy refers to the cries of Klal Yisrael, to the Shem Yisrael Hashem, to end the bitter millennium long night of exile. And Hashem replies that the great morning of redemption will come and the night of, uh, of punishment will descend upon those who oppress the Jewish people. We ask, when will this happen? When will Klai Yisrael truly desire redemption? So he says, when we really will desire redemption and we will do tshuva. That's what Rashi says. The Dubna Magid offers a different insight. He says that Klai Yisrael asks Hashem, how long will this night of Golos be? The other exiles we experienced ended in a relatively short time. But this one has been going on way too long, and Hashem replies, there have been opportune times for the Geula. The great morning of Geula has come, but it's passed unrealized. Night has descended again. If you really desire redemption, you got to take advantage of the opportunity when it comes by doing tshuva and returning to Hashem. 
And in his classic manner, the Duke Namag explains this concept with a parable. There was a habitual drunkard who as soon as the sun set would get drunk and fall asleep in a deep slumber. He was so intoxicated that he'd sleep through the night and through the entire following day. And when he woke up, it was night again. And he figured, oh, I guess it's night, but let me drink. And it happened again. And he sleeps for another 20 hours. He began to why the world was always in darkness and there never was any daylight. But the drunkard failed to realize that the day had come, but he slept through it and therefore must face night again. Says the Dubna Maggid, this is what Klal Yisrael is in the exile. We cry to Hashem to end the bitter long night of Golas. But Hashem says, morning has come. And with it, auspicious times for Gaula. But being intoxicated with sin, you slept through it and missed the chance. You only woke up after the opportunity has passed. So our boy side, we're coming out of a night. And Hashem is giving us the day. And the question is, what are we doing to bring the Mashiach? What are we doing to make ourselves worthy of the Mashiach? In another week, it's going to be Rosh Chodesh Elul. And we've got to figure what's going to be the game plan for each and every one of us for Rosh Chodesh Elul. As I've said many times, this is not the idea of getting back to normal. Normal wasn't good. Because if normal was good, we wouldn't have had to go through all this discipline. And Hashem is giving us hugs. He's giving us opportunities. Are we taking advantage of the opportunities? That's the question we have to ask ourselves to come up with a game plan, a week to go to Rosh Chodesh El. In our Hispotidus class, we started a, a journey of trying to get involved in what Rabbi Nachman calls, this is the greatest advice of repairing all the damages to a person. I would suggest those of you who are interested, you can go on our YouTube channel and go through the Hispodidu series. And I've challenged the people that have come to the class and or on Zoom. On Zoom. And I've, I've told them, we got to figure out, as the Rabbi Nachman says, the teachings say at least 15 minutes a day of Hispodidus. If Try those things. Come up with the learning uh, uh, plan for the coming month of Elul. Elul should not be frittered away with vacation time. Vacation time you got this week, next week, and that's it. We got to focus in because it's been a very, very difficult 18 months. And it's beginning to get better. We're going to be able to come back to the shul for Rosh Hashanah. And we hope all the members feel comfortable to come and to realize that the shul is the safest place in the world. And to show Hashem how worthy we should be. To go and fix up interpersonal relationships. To make a cheshbon and nefesh. All Hashem wants is tshuva. This is such an auspicious time where the efforts that we make will give us so much greater benefits than at a normal time. So may we all draw comfort from this parsha and know that the loving Father, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, has disciplined us. And let's hope that we take the hug, don't spurn the hug, take advantage of the hug, experience Hatzlacha as we come into the month of Elul and as we all be able to have a most amazing new year and hopefully there'll be one that will bring us that many steps closer to the Gaula Bimheira Amen. Thank you all for listening and have a wonderful Shabbos.